Hello, everyone. This is Phoebe. Um, I run a small fund and a corporate advisory firm, and we specialize in cross-border transactions. And today, I'm very happy to be with you and moderating the session. Should we start with uh, Ken to do a self-introduction? Sure thing. Um, Ken Shaw. Um, I spent 15 years in the United States, uh, did two SaaS companies back-to-back, -back, a B2C uh, and then a B2B. Um, so we've sort of gone through the startup journey twice, um, sold two companies, one for a pretty miserable outcome and one for an okay one. Um, returned to Australia recently, worked at uh, Potential Capital, which is in the previous panel they were talking about you know, software PE firms. So uh, Potential Capital is a billion dollar fund just by software companies. I'm now uh, investing independently and advising startups. I met Steve a couple of months back and uh, happy to be here. G'day everyone, Rob Neely from Securely. Uh, Securely is a fintech and paytech um, uh, innovative innovation provider for uh, banks and financial institutions worldwide. Our uh, claim to fame with this startup is um, we've got a patented technology that allows banks to certify social media profiles and then provide their customers with a digital wallet that's attached to the social media profile that then solves the issue of um, marketplace purchases on, and on marketplace. That's what we do now. How many startups have I done? A lot. Um, I'm 64. Uh, my most recent one prior to this was a animal health startup, completely different to fintech. And uh, we did a NASDAQ um, uh, exit on that. We sold to a NASDAQ company in 2017. So it's not my first rodeo, put it that way. Uh, g'day, Sam Riley uh, was uh, CEO and founder of Ansarada, a company that built software for due diligence used in M&A, capital raising, large procurement of infrastructure type uses. Uh, grew that from $30,000 in startup capital from the founders. Uh, to we just exited off the ASX for around 250 million and recently founded a company called Drover, which is about helping companies transition to better business models and more sustainable ways of operating. Uh, that, that was actually products that were part of Ansarada. We're doing 40,000 M&A deals. We noticed the level of compliance and risk and governance inside companies was usually substandard and when they went to do an exit it got found out in due diligence and eroded a lot of value for them so years ago we wanted to help companies run their businesses better so they can do what they do best with their products and services but not have significant gaps on the way that they're operating with risk and compliance so um yeah, so carve those businesses out of Ansarada and put them in a startup called Drover. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Pete. I'm the founding CEO of PowerPal. Uh, PowerPal is a home energy monitoring and energy efficiency platform uh, with 250,000 users uh, across Australia. Uh, we were acquired by an energy retailer called Amber Electric um, in, what was that, end of 22? And I stepped down as CEO of that business um, earlier this year, uh, now advising a range of startups on go-to-market strategy. Thank you. Well, Kent, I think that everyone's very interested to understand what are the biggest challenges from startups to scale to global companies. So could you tell us a little bit about um, what are the common challenges that you face? And perhaps that could help everyone here. Yeah, sure. Um, just getting a feel for the room. Uh, raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur here. Okay, investor or advisor? So pro? Okay, about half half. Um, look, I think one of the challenges I see in all these startups is just thinking too small, right? Not thinking global from day one. Um, there are certain industries that, you know, you've, you've got to, that are niche to Australia and, and whatnot, but if you're not chasing a global play, I'd really sort of look in the mirror hard and ask yourself why not, you know, and maybe pivot. Um, I think that's sort of one uh, big observation I have about the Australian startup scene, having been in the US for so long. Um, and coupled with that is only looking in Australia for capital, right? And so I think like there's systemic and structural weakness in the local 
capital ecosystem for startups. And I think, uh, again, thinking global when it comes to your fundraising is would be another big sort of bit of advice I'd have. Be very interested to hear you gentlemen think on that. That's a good question. Um, ha having worked both in the Australian startup ecosystem and also the US, they are so dynamically different. It's like black and white. Um, the VCs, the, the, you know, the, the, um, all of the fundraising over there is completely different. Um, and going to your point about pivoting, um, I call it sliding doors. You've got to, as an entrepreneur, you've got to recognize a sliding door and grab it. And you've got to go grab it with all your gusto that you can because it may lead you down a completely different path that provides you international access. And, and I've seen it happen on many occasions. The previous, one of my previous businesses, we had 35 startups that we were mentoring. We had a, a piece of each of them, and this is in the US. Um, and again, you, anyone that shows any interest over there, and, and they're all over you in the US, non-stop at networking events, and, and the, the, the ecosystem completely different. So um, yeah, look to the US, um, and don't you know, hold your blindfold on for Australia, because Australia is just very, very small. Yeah, I tend to agree. Like if you found a company in Australia and you're just building something here, you inev inevitably end up building a culture that heavily suits the Australian market and everything around that. And then if you then, say, three or five years later, start to think about overseas, you might find that some of the things you've made really strong here don't work overseas. And then you'll, you'll have to change and manage those changes, whereas from day one, you can probably have more of an international view and make decisions and shape the culture that way. And, um, yeah, I find the investors in the US probably the number one thing they have intrinsically is a lot more risk appetite, uh, a lot more uh, forgiveness for failure, but they, they do want you to learn from it very quickly. But um, it's, it's probably something we could get better out here. Yeah, uh, I can share some experience from um, uh, baby, uh, business that I worked at for 13 years. I had got a background in telecommunications and we, we did it the opposite way. So we became uh, market leaders in Australia and then exported our technology into Asia, um, starting in Singapore. So we were building solutions for mobile carriers and we signed up Optus and Telstra and Vodafone and they were all having a good time. And we thought, well, yeah, we've kind of done it here, right? Where's next? And selling into Asia was a completely different culture. The way you had to sell, the way you engaged, but it was a hell of a lot of fun doing it. Um, you know, sort of working out how, how these large organizations buy and how to match your solutions to them. Um, yeah, we ended up with what 60 different telco solutions across Asia pack. Um, so I wouldn't discourage people from trying hard in Australia first. If you do a good job, you can take that case study any way you like. Thank you. Well, Rod, I'm very interested in um, your NASA exit. Could you maybe let us know a little bit more about um, what other financial milestones or indicators should investors look for when assessing a fintech startup potential for high value exit? Uh, fintech, fintech startups, uh, it, I come, I'll go back to your point. It's all about scale. Can you scale it? So the metric might not, might not necessarily be the financial metric you're looking at first. If, if, they can, if it's scalable outside of Australia in a fintech sense, the world is your oyster. Um, quite literally. I mean, we, we, we spent a week in India about a month ago and we're now dealing with, it's just incomprehensible sometimes, but we've got two discussions going on over there at the moment and one bank has 400 million customers. Okay, so, and you look at the whole of Australia with 25 million. In fact, one bank, um, one bank does 25 million KYCs a month. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's a different different sphere. So it's not necessarily the financial metric. I know it doesn't answer your question, but I'd be looking at scale again. Well, I mean, I'd jump in there and be like, if you're building a tech product today and it's an English language product, again, I would really challenge you to say, why is it not global? Right? Like, and, and I'd argue with you hard. Like, if you're going to tell me, no, it only, you know, it's only an Australian thing, I'd be like, eh. I mean, I, you know, like take Wise as an example. You know, Wise is a neobank that is, is global like and they you know like how is nav and anz and cpa going to compete with someone like this i just the world's changing ai is accelerating that change um yeah so like global from day one uh both for product and for funding do you have anything that you want to add 
I, I think, look, before you, the world's a big place, so you have to diagnose where are you going to win and where are you strongest. And, you know, the foundation and biggest mistake I've ever made is prematurely scaling products before you've got really strong product market fit. And I think entrepreneurs can fall prey to that because you've got a lot of strengths around vision and strategy and you see the problem. But maybe you see the problem earlier than the market does and you can spend a lot of time with a good idea that's the wrong timing and burn through a lot of money. So product market fit, validation of that in different markets and, you know, being able to scale profitably, like your, your customer acquisition costs have to be scalable or, or at least um, on the path to scalability. Uh, otherwise, going overseas would just make you go broke quicker. <laughs> Well, Sam, uh, you were actually started from a self-funded uh, venture, right? Could you maybe let us know and share your experience with the audience here today? How did you manage to go from self-fund to where it is today and manage to get an exit? Yeah, I think the whole tech and startup world and investor world is quite, as any industry matures, it gets culture and processes. So, you know, you have angel and then C, A, B, C, D, whatever. Um we, we just got together because we saw a problem and we literally just put money in and no one left a day job. And it was what the, I think the cool kids today call it a side hustle where you, you know, we I used to work making ice creams and I'd do two day shifts, two night shifts for 12 hours. Then I had four days off. And in my four days off, I would go see potential customers who could use our product and just diagnose what problems they have, uh, you know, what what would solving them look like for them and then we would design some software, build it, show it to them, get their feedback and they'd say, oh, look, I don't always want that feature on. Can it be able to be on and off? And say, okay, we'll make it, a, you know, discretionary control, whatever. And eventually that built trust with them because, uh, you know, you can meet someone and you listen to them and do what they say, they end up trusting you. And then a few of them ran an M&A deal on our product and that gave us credibility and trust and I'd say not having capital creates constraints and those constraints forced us to be very, very focused and then that meant like sort of co-creating your products with your customers, they were sort of the outsourced design team. <laughs> so, you know, what helped us, I wouldn't even say it was a deliberate strategy, we just had to and then we picked off the top three customers who the rest of the market would respect and follow if they liked us. And then um, could we diagnose quickly our industry was based on a lot of trust and it's very risk adverse. So we're like, how can we build trust? How can we build trust? And then uh, then we would just self-fund it from there until we needed some capital to expand overseas. But that got you PM, that got you product market fit. Yes. By working so close. So you, you said a lot of smart things already, like don't spend money, like international expansion or, or just marketing in general until you've got product market fit. Um, Raising too much money can actually be really evil, um, which was, which is what happened in my first company. And co-creating a product with customers, the very best way to fund your company and hold on to equity is fund it with customer money. Yeah. And the best is if you're in a meeting or online and they say, they show one of their colleagues and they're like, yeah, I built that feature. And you're like, yeah, okay. Like, but at least they feel like they owned it and it was their idea and they, they feel like it's their product. Yeah. No, good point. Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, talking to startups that have got very promising technology, they've got, um, you know, demonstration units and market, they've got a lot of people that are sort of flocking around that technology, but they haven't got a sale. And it's like, well, if you've got all that traction, you've gone to the trouble of making a prototype, yeah. you've got ready for market, you've got all these people expressing interest, just ask for the sale, right? It's, it's not that hard. And yes, you might not have the product fully finished yet. It might not have all the bells and whistles on but if you can make that sale and then, as you say, co-develop the product with them into what's going to be to win the market, that is by far the most powerful way to, to move forward. Just to check with you guys, but I find to get product market fit the best way is day one to try sell something. And they might yeah. laugh at you, like, would you buy this? And it's like, they might laugh at you and say, well, no, you don't have six things that I need. And it's like, okay, what are they? And then you do those six and go back and say, would you buy it now? It's like, well, no, it's too big. It's too small. It's yellow. It's <laughs> but like the, you have but to sell it. Product market fit. 
like what really pisses me off is all these young entrepreneurs who are like, oh, I've got this many downloads, this much, much engagement, this much word of that, like all this crap. Product market fit. There's somebody's opening their wallet. You don't have market fit. There's got to be economic exchange, right? And, and that is then when you get interesting metrics, like what's your CAC, you know? If you can't tell me how much it's going to cost to acquire a new customer um, and scale that channel, why would I invest? Why would anybody invest? And so just like for the entrepreneurs in the room, product market fit means we've got to give you money, right? Not download, use, refer, like on Facebook. I mean, that's nice, but it's not PMF. And I think in the past two years has been very difficult for everyone to raise capital as well in the macro situation at the moment. Well, um, because Rob, I think you, you may have to Rob. Are you good? Okay. Yeah, so I think that it will be good for you guys to share some of your experience because since you guys have done so many startups and that have successful exit as well in the past, um, during a bad market, what would be the best way to go out and raise capital but still being able to maintain the business, keep it running? Uh, okay, well, I mean, my rule of thumb became... Um, Double, double. So whatever amount of money I thought I needed to raise, uh, double it. And however much time I thought it was going to take, double it. Um, I did 14 rounds of capital over 15 years, uh, about 40 million US dollars across all of those, across every type there is, you know, venture, um, you know, what would now be called seed, but for us it was series A. You know. um, yeah, so, so seed, A, B, C, then growth equity, venture debt, um, and finally, sold to private equity. Uh, yeah, but double, double. Raise twice as much, takes twice as long. And if the market sucks, like now, don't raise. You know? But the inverse rule is always be raising. Um, you know, but like runway is, runway is everything once you get like hooked on the cocaine of venture capital. You know? And that's the right metaphor. Um, like, it's dicey stuff. <laughs> Is it pink cocaine or is this normal cocaine? <laughs> Having Sorry. never used that product, um, <laughs> but like, you know, the, it's, people don't understand the risk inherent in taking yeah. picture, you know. Um, it's just not, it's not talked about much in the market. I don't. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, it's, and it's all consuming when you're raising. I watched my American CEO, we, we did a flip, the last company, we did a flip from Australia to the US in Kansas of all places, but that's the animal health capital of the world. And I watched my American CEO it consumed him nonstop. Just full time crazy. job. Yeah, full time job. Full time job. So, and he was a doctor. He was a vet, and he it took his took his view away from what he should have been doing, um, looking at the potential uh, potential commerciality of the products we were we were um, uh, representing over there. But you know, going back to raise or not raise, and and how it can change your view. Take your eye off what you're doing as an entrepreneur or a founder. This time round, we decided on purpose to use our own family money um, through through the you know family office to build the company. Then we decided to do a raise, and then we pulled the raise because it was taking our eye off what we were doing. And we also had some very large companies starting to talk to us, and the valuation changed obviously. So um, you've you've again you've got to be able to pivot quite quickly. That's that's one of the reasons. Uh. Well, I think like VCs very, very, they're dead very quietly. And like, there's a lot of horror stories out there around, um, raising capital or the wrong structure for capital. Like if you're very certain of your metrics and you've got strong PMF and you're growing month on month, like, yeah, maybe you can get venture debt or convertible notes or some debt, debt based equity. Uh, but that, that's very risky if you get debt based equity because, uh, if, if things go wrong for you as a company, those investors are not as concerned as helping you get out of it as they are just getting back their capital. Whereas if you've got an equity-based investor, where you're all in the tent together and you have to work through problems a lot more diligently, um, usually. Uh, so you know, I think the type of capital matters a lot and it depends on what stage your business is at. And again, entrepreneurs are prone to overusing their strengths in this area where they devalue risk and future scenarios that, that come back and be highly dilutive. Um, so I think if you, another consideration is some investors are really good at being hands on. 
and they've got practical experience in your industry and in your geography you're trying to expand in, they have networks, they can roll up their sleeves and actually help you execute and they become an extension of your team. Now, depending on the company, that may be very valuable to you more than money. Uh, but the other thing I'd say, I'd read this quote once and before I took capital, I said, that can't be true. And I'll just test it with the panelists. That, uh, they say once you raise capital as a CEO, 30 to 40 percent of your time will be spent on capital raising activities between investor relations and things. Is that true? Yes. Uh, ha- <laughs> half of the, like in my second company, which you know, we went to the series ABC, went the whole way through. Um, I reckon 50 percent of my time was what you loosely call IR, but it was just dealing with the BS of the cap table. Right. Um, yeah. And, um, it gets more complicated when you layer in different types of, of investors. So if you got, you know, early stage VC, later stage VC, growth equity, private equity, they've all got different expectations. They've all got different demands. Nightmare. Uh, I do what you're doing, what you're doing now is how I would do another one if I ever did self fund and family office. And I actually think with sort of what AI is doing to costs, that is the most achievable now that it's ever been before. Yeah. You know, to get to get a product to market to achieve PMF um, is is now far more attainable with a small check. Oh, oh, just as how it gets worse as you get bigger. I was at a risk conference, uh, and they're all chief risk officers. And Matt Coman, the CEO of ComBank, was there, and he said, "Oh, I'm a CRO too." And they go, "You're not the chief risk officer. You're the CEO of ComBank." And he's like, "No, I'm the chief repeating officer." Because he goes eighty percent of his week, he's just repeating messages to the team, repeating them to regulators, repeating them to investors. He spends twenty percent of his time on strategy or anything else. He's the chief repeating officer. Like it's, and that happens in a small way. As soon as you take capital, it just gets weird. Thank you. Well, I think that. We can probably jump into AI questions as well because, uh, in my opinion, AI could really help us to cut down the time of operating as well. Uh, well, can do you from from your um, background because everyone here is we run a technology company. Um, is there any way that you think could really help you to balance the time of raising capital at the same time trying to run a <laughs> business at the same time? I don't know about raising capital. That's a very man-on-man sport. Um, man on I mean, I'm not trying to, trying to be gender biased here. Person to person. Uh, person to person. I'll help you, you through. Okay. Very American over here, right? Um, like, yeah. <laughs> um, so no, I mean, I don't think I don't think AI is going to play there. But in terms of running your business, like, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, right? Like every single department. Um, I was listening to a podcast the other day where McKinsey. I mean you know, big company and meant to be smart. But they had an average uh, response time to inbound inquiry of like 48 hours and using AI they've cut it down to 30 minutes. Um, You know, like, uh, and that's the sort of thing that everybody should be doing. But every single process inside a company, like my my second company got up to 200 employees. I reckon if I was running it now, I'd be running it with like 40. Like, no joke, you know. and so, yeah, jumping on the AI bandwagon hard. Uh, if I was if I was CEOing right now, I would only be hiring like process engineers, automation guys, DevOps people. You know, um, yeah, that's where I'd be focused. Yeah, sure, but I mean, like, I'd be forcing the creators to learn Zapier and Make and you know, and and some basic coding. And I, I think I think the most important hires going forward are going to be jack of all trades, like baby COOs. You know, which is what an entrepreneur and a founder and a builder is. You're like you, you've got to be across every function. You're usually T-shaped. You, you know, you've got skills across every domain and deep in one. Um, yeah, it's an interesting topic. I, I spoke in India a few weeks ago on AI on this, on this specific topic, and there's some sixty-seven thousand or seventy thousand AI startups in the world right now. Ninety-nine percent of which will die. Correct, and there and therein lies the problem. So we were talking AI and KYC and and, and um, so forth, but the the problem is they're all good actors at the moment. The ones that are going to die, which you just talked about, are going to become potentially malicious actors in the AI scene. So they're going to go to the dark side. 
So if you're not if you're not in AI at the moment, your company should be, or or your startup should be. You should be use, utilizing it as much as you can, as Steve has done just over the last six months or so. Um, but but that's the biggest problem. Um, AI can be used for good and for bad. Yeah. And exponentially, AI can. Like every technology is like that. When we first made fire, it can cook your food and keep you warm, or it can burn your village down. But the AI is the same. Uh, it scales exponentially both ways. I was, I was, you asked a good question on email and on AI, and I was just thinking about bringing AI to market for your customers, and it made me realise that you have to bring, in my opinion, bring AI that your customers are ready for, not like let's say in the future AI in your industry for your customers could do predictive analytics and uh that, you know, predictive decision making and real time scenario analysis, et cetera. However, if they're not ready for that and they're more in looking at AI as an efficiency tool or an automation tool for a few key functions, and maybe they're not even ready for that until you can prove that the privacy and security of your of them using your AI stays in your their confounds, confines, uh, you know, they're not going to engage with this one if their mindset and maturity around AI is lower. So you, you have to design and bring AI to market in line with your customer's mindset and maturity, or maybe just be the next step ahead. But if your marketing is really glossy and you think it's awesome, but you, it scares your, your customers to death, they, they're not going to engage with your AI initiatives, in my opinion. So that that's... I agree 1,000%. Um, that's where I, I think the number one place for AI is in-house. It's internal. It's doing with one human what you would previously have done with 10. I'm working with a, a client right now who wanted to do that, right? They wanted to add AI to all their public-facing products and services. Their customers don't want to borrow it, right? Way too avant-garde and privacy issues up the wazoo. Um, and so what what I mean, my advice to them and the pivot has then been, right, we're just going to radically change every internal department you know, um, and who knows what sort of like cost savings we'll get. Uh, but it's going to be real and it's going to cost jobs. Can I just go back to you? You asked a question before about who was entrepreneurs in the audience. Um, I was in a, at a US uh, university not long ago and they have a, a course for entrepreneurship. And when I started as an entrepreneur, there was no courses. There were no courses. And yeah. there still should be no courses. Yeah. And when I challenged the dean, and she's a lovely lady, I said, come on, what is this entrepreneur course you're running? I mean, because it's and innate. teaching it's, it? It's innate. <laughs> it's inside of you, okay? It's, it's not something you can teach. If, if you could teach it, everyone would be buying it, wouldn't they? But in the end, she came around and said, well, Rob, it's really a sexy name for a business course. <laughs> and we can sell a lot more courses if we call it the entrepreneur course. And that's the difference. An entrepreneur is someone that gets to the Friday of each week and can't figure, does not have the money for payroll on Monday. That's what an entrepreneur is rather than just, you know, starting a business. They're also the <laughs> But it's a mindset, I think is what you're saying, rather than it's not really something that can be taught. Yeah, I mean, I think you can learn skills along the way, but I, I, I probably agree with that. I think it's baked in. Well, Pete, did you want to add on the AI talk? Because your business is in power, right? So it helps people to look into saving energy. Yeah, it's, re it's really easy, uh, interesting. So um, we, we um, our product was a digital product. It's delivered as a mobile app. And we built in all sorts of advisory components into the app. And we have product-led growth um, strategies to drive people into those um, those uh, yeah, the feed feedback loops that help them to understand and help them to choose the next round of product. And people engage with it. They loved it. They gave us great feedback, but they didn't buy we had to hire a sales team to pick up the phone and talk to these people and work them through you know, person to person on what their drivers were and convince them that these, you know, what they'd learned through the app was, was actually the next step that they wanted to, uh, to take. So I think AI has got its place, but I'd agree. It's more of a back end tool. At the end of the day, business, businesses sell to people and people like to talk to people. And I don't think that's ever going to change. I agree because relationship is something that you can never replace. That's my understanding for everything. Uh, well, well, and closing a deal is like that's a mutu an immutable skill set. You know, if you're good at closing, life's going to be okay. Um, yeah. 
Well, we don't have much time left, but if you're going to sum up one sentence, each of you, for business to go from startup to scalability, what would you, rep what would you advise to everyone here, whoever that is running a business right now? Okay, <laughs> okay. Five as, much as, as much as you want, okay? <laughs> Buckle in, it's a long, wild ride. Um, the most important thing at any startup and, and any journey is get the right people around you. Don't take anyone's check. We had a two checks back recently because they weren't a good investor fit as we got to know them better. Yeah, probably like if you get um, better, your customers will demand you get bigger. So an obsession around the customer and their problems and how can you help them more, how can you help them faster, what other problems do they have. Like, if you, the more you know that, that's the foundation for everything else. You know, you can scale that with the brand or other things. Yeah, yeah I've got a favourite saying, which is nothing, it's a nahito. Nothing interesting happens in the office. you got to get out there. you got to talk to customers. you got to be in front of people and you're pumping that learning cycle as fast as you can. And once you get the product market fit, growth is inevitable. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank you.